Hello and welcome to this short introduction to the Script 100 this year. My name is Joe Shorthouse, I'm the features editor for Script and I also edit the Script 100. I've been covering the pharmaceutical industry for the last nine years and I'm specifically tasked with talking to the C-suite about uh, their strategies uh, for pharma and biotech, really what makes them tick. Uh, I'm very happy to be joined today by our data editor, John Hodgson, and our news editor, Suki Vergi. Before we continue with our discussion about what we're going to be seeing in the Script 100 this year, if I could just ask you to introduce yourselves uh, and give us a little bit of background about what you do on Script. Yes, as Joe said, I'm Script's data editor. That basically means that I'm in charge of gathering the numbers for the Script 100. Uh, despite its name, the Script 100 covers about 600 companies, uh, at least we have done this year and I'll be talking about some of the number crunching results that we've done uh, in shortly. Hi, so as Joe said, I'm Scripps News Editor and I'm actually part of a large team of journalists around the world and we cover the global pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry and we make sure our subscribers have the commercially relevant information that they need to make business critical decisions. For those of you who haven't read the Script 100 before, in a nutshell it's our annual look at the performance and the prospects of the global pharmaceutical industry. We cover a wide range of topics, we cover business of course, but we also cover things like market access, policy regulation uh, and clinical trials and R&D in that side of the industry as well. Um, we really try to get to the crux of the issues that are keeping pharmaceutical executives awake at night uh, and we also make sure that the issues that we're looking at and the topics um, are relevant for the next 12 months so we're relevant the whole year round. Uh, one of the main uh, parts of the Script 100 is of course the data um, and I'd just like to talk to John now um, as the person charged with collecting all this data. Um, what data do we collect um, and also was there any surprises for you this year? Were there any particular movers and shakers within the league tables that you wanted to highlight? Okay, so what data do we collect? We look at about 600 companies um, overall. So that's our, our universe. These are companies that are either producing uh, drugs, selling drugs, um, or researching into, in, in the pharmaceutical uh, area. Um, so in fact, of the 600 or so companies, nearly 350 don't actually sell any drugs, they're just doing research. Uh, we'll talk about them a bit later. And we collect a number of metrics on those. These are the sort of things that you'd find in annual filings, but we also uh, investigate private companies as well. So we've got uh, overall revenues, then pharma-specific revenues, drug sales, um, R&D spending, then various operating uh, profits, uh, overall profits, and then assets and liabilities, and employees, in fact. Um, so. You, meant, you asked about uh, any surprises. Um, yes, I would say there's a surprise this year. The surprise is that overall pharmaceutical sales have decreased since last year. Uh, and that's uh, a uniform picture across different groups of the company. So if I can just go into a bit more detail about the 600 or so companies. If you take the whole 600, then uh, the pharmaceutical sales have gone down about 3% um, since last year. Um, in the top 20, it's also 3%. The top 20 account for uh, nearly 70% of the pharmaceutical sales, so it's a very top-heavy set. Um, the next 50, sales decreased 3% as well, and it's only in the, in the group from 50 to 100 in the ranking, so the 51st and to the 100th company, where sales have basically been flat. Now, despite the fact that sales have gone down, the operating profit, the difference between you know, the, the cost of getting those goods to the market uh, and the, the, the selling cost, uh, the selling price, uh, has risen. So pharmaceutical operating profit has gone up 11% across the board and in the top 20 and in the next 30 and in the 50 to 100 group. So what seems to be happening there is that um, you know, flat sales or at least slightly shrinking sales and yet profitability is still there net profits also up, so the, the companies are paying their shareholders. Um, now, what hasn't changed very much and doesn't change very much on a year-to-year -year basis is the overall level of sales. Um, in fact, since 2010, the level of pharmaceutical sales has hardly changed at all. Um, and so what's really remarkable about uh, 
a comp individual company performance is if in that context they manage to force themselves into the top 10 or into the top 20. So I would point at um, a couple of companies that, in fact the only two companies that have come into the top um, 20 in the last couple of years, Gilead, and that's come in on the back of uh, massive sales of HC, hepatitis C drugs, Savaldi and Harvoni, uh, and Allegan, which has come into the top 20 through merger and acquisition. So Allegan is basically Allegan plus Actavis plus Forest Laboratories and a number of other companies that have all come together. So you can force your way into the top 20 either by merger or by massive growth in a particular area. And of course, we don't just look at financial data, we also look at R&D data sets as well. Um, are there any insights into that that you can give us this year? Is there any um, nuggets that you can point out? So R&D spending can be looked at as an investment by the company. And um, happily, it seems that R&D investment has grown, despite the fact that pharmaceutical revenues uh, have slightly shrunk. So across the 620 odd companies, uh, R&D spending is now $144 billion per year um, in 2015. That's the year that we're looking at, so it's a financial year. Um, and that's about 20% of the, R of the uh, pharmaceutical revenues. Uh, and that's about 1% up overall. Um, if you look at the top 100 companies, so in a, in a sense, the script 100, mm. Uh, R&D spending has increased about 1.6%. Uh, and in that layer from company 50 to company 100, it's increased about 7%. So a lot of the increase in spending is due to, as it were, the up and coming companies uh, who, have, who, who are spending a lot more than they were a, a few years ago. And that's largely because their drugs are progressing and they're having to spend more money in later stage clinical trials. It's not necessarily that they're expanding their effort uh, by developing more drugs, they're just developing later stage uh, drugs. So the distribution of R&D spending is a bit less lopsided than the distribution of pharmaceutical revenue. Uh, basically the top 100 companies uh, in, in the sales league uh, produce 95% of the sales. Uh, in R&D, you have to reach out to 200 companies to get 95% of the overall sales. So it's still pretty lopsided. It's still very top-heavy, uh, but it's less top-heavy. R&D spending is a bit further distributed than, than, than revenue. Um, now, one of the things I looked at for R&D was all those companies that I mentioned uh, at the beginning um, who are not making any drug sales at all. So 350-odd companies. Uh, making no sales at all, they are spending between them something like $11.5 billion, or they did in 2015. And the question is, well, that sounds like a lot of money. Mm. Um, and it's not really that much money if you think that that, that spending from the 250, 350 companies rather uh, is equivalent to less than the top two R&D spenders, uh, Roche and Novartis. So they, between them, spend about $16 billion a year on R&D, and the other 350 companies who are not making any money spend 11.5. So if you want to invest in R&D, you have to be making money on drug sales. And that's a message that I think the pharmaceutical industry likes to amplify quite a lot. Um, and we hear that quite often. So why do we care about the, uh, the 350 companies that basically don't make any drug sales? Well, if we refer back to the Gilead example, one of those companies uh, about five years ago was called Farm Asset. They didn't have any uh, drug revenues. Um, Gilead bought them for about $11 billion. And this year, uh, 2015, Gilead's sales based on the drugs that they got from Farm Asset were worth $19 billion. So it may well be that the hepatitis C market uh, is a bit of a flash in the pan. People kind of expect that uh, as the patients are cured, because this is what the drugs do, that the market might dry up a bit. And Gilead is facing competition. It's also facing criticism about drug pricing strategies. Um, so its performance next year may not be, it may be, may be good enough, but a few years hence, uh, it's likely that it'll decrease. But even so, that investment 
in farm asset is clearly paid off. Thanks very much, John. Uh, and for those of you who want to download the data, um, everything is going to be available uh, in Excel format and in PDF format to download from the website. Uh, now, uh, as I mentioned at the, the beginning, um, a lot of the topics we talk about uh, are forward facing, so we're looking at the challenges and the opportunities uh, that the pharmaceutical industry is going to be facing in the next 12 months, possibly the next five years, 10 years ahead. Uh, and we couldn't really create the Script 100 this year without discussing Brexit. Um, I just want to talk to Suki now. Um, Suki, I know that you recently chaired a roundtable um, with people such as uh, P PwC, the BIA, the ABPI, um, and I was just wondering what the feeling was in the room. Um, what are the main concerns that those uh, that those kind of real big kind of players in the in the pharmaceutical industry? What were the concerns that they had? So, Joe, the main concerns faced by the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry in the UK and globally is around the uncertainty that the potential, well, the upcoming Brexit generates. There's uncertainty around access to talent, to people. There's uncertainty around access to investment from European Union initiatives such as the Horizon 2020. There's a lot of uncertainty around drug approval regulations. You know, what's going to happen to the EMA? What's going to happen to the people that work at the EMA? There's uncertainty around trade routes and the supply chain. Unfortunately, we don't have any firm timelines as to when that uncertainty is going to be resolved. But the people that we spoke to at the round table that we held, um, these were key players that are working hard to advise government, the UK government, on what pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies need to feel reassured, to continue to prosper, and not just the industry in the UK, but what global pharma needs to continue to feel confident in investing in the UK. Uh, another thing that we spoke about was, were there any potential silver linings in the post-Brexit world. And we came up with a few, but we really had to dig deep. Mm -hmm. That sounds really interesting, and I really look forward to reading the article, and I'm sure a lot of our readers are going to be really interested as well. Um, we also cover in a lot of depth the runners and riders for who's going to be hosting the EMA um, going forward. So that's something that's also um, a very large part of, uh, as Suki was saying, the, the worries and concerns. Uh, and that's all going to be included as well. And of course, another big theme for discussion in the Script 100 this year is C-suite succession. Uh, we've seen a number of big personalities who have worked in the pharma industry for years and years and years decide um, to leave. Um, we have people such as, obviously, GSK's CEO, Andrew Whitty, uh, George Skangos from Biogen, John Lechleiter from Lilly, um, and in, um, uh, in Germany, we have Grinnenthal's Professor Pax. Um, I just was wondering, Thinking about the industry moving forward, we're seeing a lot of themes coming forward to be discussed for the next kind of five, ten into infinity years. Things like um, value-based pricing, uh, outcomes-based reimbursement. We have these really, really big issues that are coming forward. But we also have big opportunities such as digital health and those opportunities. And I was just wondering if you thought that we needed a new kind of leader um, for the C-suite um, as we kind of march forward into this unknown world as we, as, as we go along with the global pharma industry. Suki, any thoughts? Joe, one feature of management teams at Big Pharma that we've commented, uh, commented on a lot at Scrip is the scarcity of women at the top of yes. Big Pharma. GSK mm -hmm. recently obviously knocked this on the head mm -hmm. by appointing Emma Walmsley as its CEO elect and she'll take over from Sir Andrew Whitty when he leaves next, next year. But what I think actually is much more relevant um, in terms of characteristics mm -hmm. of big pharma management is the fact that she comes from a non-pharma background. Yes. She was the head of GSK's consumer healthcare division. Prior to that she was um, a senior leader at L'Oreal. She's not the only one that has a non-pharma background and is you know, leading up big pharma. For example, Joe Jimenez at Novartis, uh, he also came from a consumer background. What these non-pharma people bring to pharmaceutical companies is their outside-the-box thinking. They have fresh new ideas for success and growth at big pharma. And obviously, big pharma really needs 
new thinking. The challenges are unprecedented that Big Pharma fa faces, and it will only be these people, I feel, that will make the difference. Uh, just to pick up on something that Suki's introduced mm. with the topic of gender, I mean, one of the things that happens when uh, the C-suite turns over, especially at the CEO level, so when we get new CEOs, they have a new management team. And that seems to be a trigger for actually increasing the number of women on those management teams. So it's almost as if, uh, you know, gender equality, it, we're a long way from that in pharma. It's, it's down about 20% in the, in the top 20 companies and, and so forth. That's way, way off base. But um, any change that does occur seems to be associated with, with uh, CEO changes. So uh, I would be optimistic that with all the, the C-suite replacements that are, that are, are, are that have just happened or are going to happen in the next few years, that there will be some shift uh, in the gender balance. Um, so that's one criteria, and I don't know what you know women will bring, particularly that that men haven't been able to bring. But you know, it's going to be dredging the pool of talent a bit more thoroughly. Mm. I don't mean dredging; I mean uh, fishing in the pool of talent more thoroughly. Uh, the other thing that I think you know the C-suite needs to look to is the topic that you were really mentioning earlier, the, the sense that you're going to have to integrate with the digital health yes. uh, area so that uh, you know, companies are edging towards doing that. Um, they are talking about uh, diagnostic-led uh, pharmaceuticals and, and that means getting hold of the, the sort of indicators that can tell whether you're going to have to use this drug or not, whether this drug is appropriate for you, and that means reaching out into new areas. Mm -hmm. Some companies are obviously equipped to do that. Roche and so forth obviously have diagnostic divisions. But the whole integration of uh, that kind of digital area requires much more than just accessing the technology. It's a kind of, it's a different way of thinking about healthcare that requires a lot of input from the patients. Mm. And so people talk about patient-centric <laughs> uh, development. Well, that really needs to go right to the, to the basic root of you know, looking upon patients and potential patients as a resource in the first place and then integrating that into your business. And I think that integrative process is something that the C-suite leaders need to be looking at. And this new management needs to not be scared of digital health, not see it as a competitor, these digital health companies, not see them as competitors or a threat, but um, look at ways in which they could work together um, for, I guess, for the, for the good of the patients, really. Well, they can see them as a threat. I mean, they can leave them out there as a threat or they can integrate them in yeah. as a co collaborative and cooperative uh, fundamental in their own business. It's, it's, it's their choice. I think those that integrate are going to be more successful than those that... That, that just try and compete. Okay. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I really appreciate you sharing your insights with me. Um, and I look forward to seeing the Script 100 that we can create this year. So thank you very much. And incidentally, this year we have uh, C-suite interviews with the newish CEO of Takeda, Christoph Weber. We also have uh, an interview with John Lechleiter, the outgoing CEO of Lilly. Uh, and we also have um, interviews with the outgoing and incoming CEOs of Grunenthal. Um, so I think it's going to be a really good insight into where the, where the future of pharma is going uh, and also just having a little look back in the past to look at some of those challenges and how they've been addressed in the past and maybe what we can learn in the future for um, uh, the pharma industry to come. Uh, the Script 100 is going to be published at the beginning of December. All the content, the data, everything is going to be downloadable and viewable um, in PDF and Excel format. Um, and I really hope you enjoy it. So thank you for watching.